Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode of the Deaf Connect show. Before we get started with our show, I have a special announcement. In this episode, one of you have an opportunity to win my book called Extending Microsoft Power Apps with Power Apps Component Framework. Now, to win this book, I will be sharing the details at the end of the video. So, stay tuned. Now, for today, our guest is from Calgary, Canada. He is a solution architect and write blogs on his website called transform365.blog. He is here to talk about his new tool called Power Portal Web API Helper, which already has more than 5,000 downloads. So let's welcome our guest, Omar Zarur. Hey Omar, how are you doing? Hey Danish, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, it's nice to have you on the show. And uh, yeah, um, let's let's get started with it. Um, so first thing that I want to ask you is, how did you start with the Power Platform journey? Like how did you get into Power Platform? Yeah, so uh, initially I was a software developer working with mostly like C sharp and uh, .NET in general. And uh, after that, I moved to a company in 2016 or 27, early 2017 uh, called Adoxio. Um, and basically their business is dy was Dynamics uh, 365 and Power Platform. It wasn't their Power Platform yet, but uh, I started there as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I moved there without previous uh, experience with the whole thing. And I worked with some great guys there uh, where I learned this thing quickly and I got exposed to so many projects uh, in a short amount of time. And I stayed with them. Uh, they got acquired by KPMG. Then I stayed with them like for a total of two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And I'm currently working independently as a contractor in the same field. Yeah, nice, nice. So you are a contractor, right? So how does that work out? Like, I know um, my wife is also a contractor, so it's like short period of time that you are on a project and then after the project uh, is over, you have to look for other projects. How does that all contracting thing works out yeah. for you? Yeah, I, I, I was lucky to get a contract uh, like in, in a couple of months, it will be two years with the same big client. Oh, nice. So it's kind of stable. Yeah, uh, I get like uh, in my free time other like small things to do here and there. Uh, but the thing is with contracting, I found is it's, it's a bit more flexible uh, with the hours. And you kind of basically, you, you don't need to deal with anything else in the organization except just do the mm -hmm. work. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so, that's basically, I'm still, I'm still weighing the full time versus contracting mm -hmm. thing, but like, I, I didn't make a decision yet to go back to full time. Right. Yeah. Because, uh, there are drawbacks to each one of them. You don't have, if you're contracting, you don't have to deal with the poli office politics and whatsoever. Yeah. And with, if you're yeah. contracting, I see the major drawback is you, you, ha you are hesitant to take uh, vacations because now if you take vacations, you're losing money, right? So <laughs> that's one of the... It is something at the beginning. At the beginning, yeah, I kind of, it, it felt like that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I spent some time just changing my mentality is that it's all part of the package, right? right? So you have to take vacations. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it's... Yeah, you have to decompress yeah. at some point, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah, so... Uh, how did you get into portals? Like, why did you started uh, like diving into portals, and how was your experience as a configurator uh, on a portals? Yeah. So again, part of my work with Adoxio slash KPMG, uh, like most of the projects I worked on, they had a portal component in mm -hmm. them, uh, and I kind of was lucky enough to come into the portal on when it became online. Not when it uh, when it was uh, 
ADX Studio nice. basically when the full was there. I, it was actually, I, I had some exposure to the ADX Studio portal uh, with the ASP.NET code behind the scenes. But since everything became online, so I, I just came to a, a, a portal that has ways to configure and customize it and has lots of limitations because you don't have access to the backend code. So I had to learn uh, everything that can be done, like Liquid and uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and the front mm -hmm. end, uh, and Web APIs to help basically uh, with increasing the functionality and with the introduction of Flow, also adding using Flow with Portal, some uh, using like HTTP Web APIs. Uh, but yeah, it's it's mostly came as part of the package with other projects I learned and. Uh, the 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 Adoxio company that I worked with basically a lot of people there were the original creators of the original ADX Studio portal, ah. so they had lots lots of experience in it, and I yeah I got to learn from uh, really expert people there. Oh, that's that's nice. So who were those people? Do you remember the, their name? Yeah, so uh, there is Col Colin Colin Garlander. He's yeah, uh, yep. MVP and uh, Connell Trebethy and Alan Mervitz. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Alan Mervitz, he did a lot of work that I worked with uh, regarding the, uh, you know, how to export solutions and uh, import them using PowerShell. He has libraries mm -hmm. that he built, and we were using them to do all the DevOps uh, related things with the solutions. Nice. Uh, yeah, and uh, he has like most of the people there they had really really good experience uh and they were just yeah, yeah they, they the thing is like when i joined there because i didn't have prior experience i was kind of in a condensed training uh for a, f uh, a few weeks right. uh then i was just exposed exposed to projects then uh i was actually developing or leading some development in some projects after mm -hmm. that so yeah i think things were very quick yeah. there yeah nice that you got to work with such wonderful people so yeah yeah they're yeah. great okay so now here you are to show us your tool uh, about um, power portal um, web web api helper now wh mm -hmm. how did you come up with this idea of creating this tool on xrm toolbox yeah so like most of the tools in the toolbox, it's all about productivity. If you can do something with a tool in a, in one or two minutes instead of half an hour, that's a win. So from my, when I started playing with this preview feature of Web API, I, I found it difficult a little bit to follow the documentation with some settings that they need to be set up for the portal mm -hmm. to work with the Web API. And I had to go and check a lot of uh, other plugins in XML Toolbox called Metadata Browser, where I had to go check each entity or each relationship or uh, each field, uh, what's it's the proper name that needs to be in the site setting for the web API. So I, I just said, okay, I will expose them in a special tool that just deals with the portal. It's still not, uh, it's not feature complete yet. I have still a couple of features to add, but as is now, it is good, it's usable. Yeah, and I, uh, I, I must say that I've used it and it looks so neat, yeah. uh, so tidy. So yeah, um, it's it's very uh, good. So uh, can you share us, uh, the, can you sh start sharing the screen and then show the uh, viewers how to work with the tool? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, just starting with the documentation on, on, on this piece here in, in Microsoft documentation, uh, like just as a, a quick introduction, Portal Web API is still in preview, okay, and soon it's going to be generally available. Uh, there is a few things you need to set up if you want to expose an entity uh, on the Web API. Mm -hmm. The first thing is the old thing, which is entity permissions. Uh, if you want to expose contacts to be uh, able, we, if we want to expose contacts uh, to this web API feature in the portal, we need to set up the proper entity permission. Nothing new here. Mm -hmm. It's the same old, right? right? But after that, 
they introduced three settings or like two especially for entities and one general setting that uh, give us additional filtering or additional layer of security on the entity with entity permissions you can expose okay i want to be able to uh, write or update a contact there is no uh, specification to which fields you can update on a contact mm -hmm. right so that's why they, they introduced this uh, set site setting it's called web api then the entity logical name then uh, slash mm -hmm. fields where you list a comma separated list of fields that you you want to be uh, you want to expose to the web api every other field it won't work with the web api so that's good when you have a uh, some fields like SIM numbers, you don't want any chance of anyone to update them or uh, create a SIM number for someone, right? Uh, so, so that's where you don't... Yeah. So just to clarify, yeah. when it's, when you say entity name, that's a schema name that you're expecting in the site setting. And then when you say fields, yeah. the attribute names are the schema attribute names of the fields, correct? So that's the thing, like entity name here is uh, the, the logical name of the entity. Uh, for example, wow. account is account with all lowercase, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, fields is, is a little bit tricky. So, so for, let's say, a single line of text field that's called uh, address, it will be the logical name of that mm -hmm. field, okay? But if you have a lookup that uh, called, for example, uh, on, on the contact entity, uh, primary contact, you will need the schema name of, of that. So that's where I found it a, a little bit difficult. It's not always the logical name. Mm -hmm. uh, and for relationships, for lookups, it's different as well. Right. Uh, I, I, it is the, what in the, it's called the navigation property name, which is mostly matches the schema name, but not always, which is weird a little bit. Yeah, that's what we use so, for the OData queries as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so uh, so basically, initially I started with lots of trial and error uh, to get the field names uh, right. Uh, so yeah, the, the the first entity. So this is the main one that the tool is centered around the fields. Mm -hmm. There is one to enable and disable an entity for Web API. If you just set it to true for the uh, special specific entity, then it's enabled. Otherwise, it's disabled. Okay. Okay. And there is a general site setting that disables or enables on the site level the kind of developer-friendly error just to debug mm -hmm. things. Yeah, and just by looking yeah. at this documentation, uh, I can I can see that it lacks a lot of those intricacies or a lot of those details that you would need yeah. to know when you're configuring Web API on the portals. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, here to continue, I have uh, like a trial environment where I have the site settings list here. I'll just go open the tool from the beginning here. So I'll just close this and open it. So the tool initially asks you to connect, of course. Uh, I'm already connected to my environment. It asks you to load entities in the system. Now, this list of entities is... Uh, not the all all entities in the system. So in the documentation, they specify that only deal with data related entities. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there is no uh, flag on an entity in, in in the SDK that says is it data entity or entity. So there is no easy way to filter out those uh, entities that are configuration entities. Okay, mm -hmm. but what I, I did my best by, for example, as this as the as the documentation said, don't use any of these ADX underscore entities, which mm -hmm. are for the configuration, right? So anything right. that belongs to these entities, uh, I don't include it. Plus, I don't include some other entities that I found them to be configuration, like related to uh, some Microsoft products. But still, this list may contain some configuration entity that I couldn't filter out. Mm -hmm. But the user in general should take into account that this fee the whole feature should be about data accounts contacts cases uh, right. right so whatever you're exposing on the on the portal is what you would be configuring it here 
Exactly. Yeah. So let's go with, for example, uh, the account entity. Okay. So when we uh, click on a specific entity, what I do here is I go and get uh, and uh, I go and check if there are site settings already configured for the account entity. Okay. So since you can see here that I have two site settings, one called enabled, one fields for the account, mm -hmm. and the enabled one is true, and the account fields, it's set to start. This means all the fields for the account entity are exposed, and it is enabled. And you will see that the tool reflects that, because it, it goes and reads those settings, and the mm -hmm. uh, checkbox, checkbox here, right? Now, mm -hmm. uh, Let's actually start with an entity that's maybe I'll just delete this and go and uh, go to the account entity again. Okay, so you will see that we don't have anything selected for the account entity. Uh, and this checkbox is unchecked, all the fields are unchecked. Right. Uh, before we, we go and check here, you know, as we discussed in the beginning, for this to work, an entity permission needs to be set up for the account entity. Mm -hmm. Also, I checked that there is an entity permission that exists for the account entity. Now, I don't know if this entity permission allows what you're going to do, like create or delete or update, but it is there. So you can go and maybe configure it more to match your needs. If there is no one, no entity permission, I, I will show it in a, in a second, this message will change. Anyway, mm -hmm. let's come back to the entity here. I can go select all at, uh, attributes, or I can specifically select the things uh, I want. So the I selected the fields for, mm -hmm. I, I can select few fields for the account entity, click save. And when I go back to the site settings, you will see that those fields are common separated here, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, now, you, just to, to to go into another feature here, I there is a few s snippets that I generate for just ease of, uh, if you want to copy these and use them in your code. The benefit for these snippets is when you select those fields and you select the operation you want to create, I kind of generate a simple post. Uh, op like, for example, for the basic create, I generate a simple post operation mm -hmm. uh, and the two things here that i put the plural name of the company of the, of the of the entity which is accounts like for simple entities it's direct but you know when you have right. a custom entity, sometimes it's not straightforward to know the collection name so the tool goes and gets the the collection name and also the fields you selected i kind of list them here with some uh, default values, so so you know that those fields are uh, you can include them in a create operation, and those are some sample values where you can change them. Okay, mm -hmm. you can copy this snippet and just put it in uh, in your web file or in your JavaScript in the portal. Uh, also, if you change this to update operation, you will see that one field disappeared, which is the ID of the account. Because the ID is not, uh, you can create it, but you can't update it, right? So I check there is a flag in the field. Is it valid for create or is it valid for update? For for the update, I I don't put it here, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there is also update single, where you can update a single value here, where you need to put the the, the value uh, the attribute name, or a basic delete, where you can delete a record or delete single attribute as well if you want to delete a single record. So all of these, uh, they are the basic ones. There is a couple missing, which is associating and uh, disassociating records. Still, they are work in progress. I found them to be a little bit more difficult than what I expected. Mm -hmm. You yeah. will see here like, how to attach to uh, between relationships, one to many, many to one, and many to many with mm -hmm. other records. Yeah. Right? Well, what about like lookup fields or like fields that are like new data types are introduced like image or file right yeah uh, if you have those kind of attributes selected can you update those okay so uh 
I'll give an example on the contact entity here. Okay, so you can see that the contact entity. Uh, I actually before I created a lookup, I think called dummy test. Yeah, test case. This one. Okay, mm -hmm. this case is a lookup on the contact entity to the case entity. So if I select this, you will see. First of all, test case is a lookup. So we don't put the logical name of like. A51 underscore test case uh, with all lowercase. We have to put the uh, navigation property name here based on the the other plugin, the metadata browser, which is like TCAP, which is here matches the schema name. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this basically, if I save, uh, contact fields, you will see that I added. As as we discussed, it's not the logical name, right? So it's like it's contact ID dot uh, and then the logical name, but yeah. it could be different as well, depending on your entity name and your lookup. Exactly, exactly. So also like other than uh, it has a different kind of uh, name, not the logical name. Also in the snippets, uh, this is what they call deep insert, right? So if you want to create a contact, also create a case in the same API code. Okay, so mm -hmm. here, this is how it looks like with a deep insert, mm -hmm. where you need to specify the, the case fields in here. And I, I just point to a URL for deep insert because like there is no place to explain it here. Okay, mm -hmm. right. And with the update, it's not deep insert. Maybe you want to update the case lookup on that contact. Mm -hmm. So go with a different format, which is uh, the way we do it with OData with the back end before. OData right. defined and you, you provide basically the, the, the link to that incident that you are binding to. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And portal yeah, URL. You have, yeah, that's what I was going to point is you have used this portal URL. Where is that yeah. defined? Yeah, so it is actually it's missed here in the in the snippet, but I should have a var portal URL equal something. It is the URL of the portal you're using. Like, uh, so in, in our case, this will be the portal, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. it is basically yeah the portal. So you have a fully qualifying uh, URL for the incident. Okay, I see. Uh, yeah, so that's for this now. On the contact entity, there is a field called entity image, okay? Mm -hmm. And that field uh, here, one, this one. So entity image, I actually, I should have put this in a comment, not inside this. But um, anyway, so entity image is not a, it's not a normal field. It's, a, it's kind of a virtual field based on the types in the SDK, okay? And virtual fields can be images or something else. In this case, entity image is is should be a byte array, okay, where you store your image in a base sixty four. Mm -hmm. So, when if if you want to update the entity image on the portal, for example, on the contact entity, you need to provide a base sixty four string of that image to this field, and it will be right. stored in a byte array in in uh, in the in the in that words. Uh, so it's a virtual field. So specifically you need to go and read about that specific field you are targeting uh, I, I I don't I just I don't want to confirm but is it always like it needs to be in a byte array or maybe other fields they have different format to be stored so I can't confirm 100% what this field will be for anything other than image okay mm -hmm. right. uh, in, in the case of entity image it's a virtual field I put a, as an example uh, it needs to be a base 64 string. And I did mm -hmm. this, I tried it actually, and it worked. Uh, so I, I don't know if there is other types, uh, other uh, data types that can be stored here other than base 64 uh, or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But what is that uh, other tab on the code snippet where it says wrapper functions? What is the advantage yeah. of using that? Yeah, so. Uh, in the documentation, Microsoft provides uh, like this piece of code where you need to put it inside like a file or web file or somewhere in your website where you can access it easily. Mm -hmm. So 
it's basically a, a way to take your request and send it to that reverse. And what it, this does actually, it just puts a header, a authentication header uh, inside the request and sends it using AJAX, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a special like uh, function just for the portal, it's called shielded bit token deferred. So you don't need to worry about authentication with the dataverse. It just gets a token, puts it as a header called request verification token, and sends the request and gets the result back to you. And you can see that this exposes uh, on the window level an object called Web API. Web API, right. So that's where, where you see in the snippet, I call Web API dot save Ajax. That's where I ah, in the Ajax right. option here. It's the same thing, like there is a save Ajax here, I'm just calling it. So you need to put this, I, I have some con a comment here. You need to take this, put it somewhere, either one page where you need this API to be available, the web API to be available and you don't want it available anywhere else in the web portal, or mm -hmm. you can just put it on maybe uh, on a, in the footer or in the header where it, it's like available everywhere, right? Okay, so it, so, if I have to use Web API on that form, uh, on a global level, then it has to be either in the header or footer. So it 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 has this particular wrapper function gets loaded on each and every page. Yeah. If I have to expose it on certain pages, then I have to make sure that only on those certain pages this wrapper function exists, so that you can actually call the operations uh, for Web API. Yeah, if you want to expose it on specific pages, it's actually good to put it in a web template. Uh, and just include that web template in that page you want it. So where you, you right. need to put this the whole code every time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense actually. Yeah, yeah, a single line. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this is like as you can see, the the, the tool is not uh, it's it's pretty simple. Uh, it just exposes the fields so that it saves you time from going looking each field what it needs to be in in uh, in uh, the metadata browser. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about uh, like if I have multiple websites on the portal? Because that's also is possibility, right? I have uh, a employee portal and then I have a customer portal. So and both of them might need different web uh, web API configurations. Yeah. So it is aware of the websites. So basically, I only have one website currently. But so uh, the 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 site settings are website specific. You know, when you go create site setting. You, you need to specify the website for that site right. setting. Uh, so if you change this, everything will reset here. So I don't know about the contact entity anymore now because it's not enabled for the new website. So you can change the website and you need to redo the the configuration for the entities for that specific website and separately. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, this, uh, this is, uh, since you mentioned the website, this is the inner error tracking, it's a website level. That's why, why I don't put it on the entities. Uh, mm -hmm. You can just disable it or enable it and it will disable it for that specific website selected here. Okay. 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 Right. Cool. Yeah. And and you were also going to show, uh, uh, the, I think so we got a little sidetrack, but you were also going to show this activity entity permission if it is not found and what that kind of message looks like. Yes. Yes. So, okay. So let's I see if this one actually uh, active contact assignments. Let's see if this is enabled or not. Okay, this is enabled. Let me choose an ent another. Uh, uh, I'll just choose an invoice. Okay. The invoice entity. You will see uh, I have enabled the invoice previously, but it won't work because I say here the selected entity has no related active entity permissions found one is needed for the web API calls to work, okay? Mm -hmm. So even though I enabled it for web API and we should see site settings for the invoice entity here, as you can see, mm -hmm. uh, but it won't work because that other layer of security using entity permissions uh, is not set up. Mm -hmm. so as a shortcut, I can, uh, someone can click on this one, okay? Uh, where this button will create an entity permission, a global level entity permission, so uh, and assign it to the administrator web role. I'm assuming that the one who is basically building this is kind of has administrator permission on the portal, and I don't want anyone else to get an entity permission that's a global who is not an administrator. Okay. Right. 
so I create this and this basically will make it work, but it will not make it secure because you maybe you don't want it a global level. Okay, you want it maybe a contact level. So you need mm -hmm. to go and modify that into permission I auto created for you. Uh, it's just like this to save some time. If you are debugging things and they're not working, maybe you missed the entity permission. You 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 open this tool, you click click this button, and it starts working again. But doesn't mean that this is the solution, the final solution. You need to go to the entity permission and modify it. Right. So so, I, yeah. so whenever a user uh, or whenever the portal configurator is configuring this, they have to make sure proper entity permissions are configured uh, so that the APIs can work. So if you don't have the create permissions configured in entity permission and if uh, a create web API is been invoked, it would throw an error, correct? Yes. Okay. They have to match basically. Okay. Yeah, this is the entity permission we just created. I, I mark it as auto-generated because maybe they need to rename it something else and I assign it to the administrator web room. Okay. okay. Uh, that's it. That's it in general. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Can you also show how people can download this tool? Yeah. So, uh, if you just go to the configuration and the tools list, you can. There is a nice feature. The new the new portal has some basically classification here. If you go to right. the portal section, um, uh, this is here the last one. Yeah. Port for Portal yeah. Web API Keeper, and yeah, yeah, just install it. Yeah, yeah. This was a new feature that I really liked about XRM Toolbox, yeah. where you can actually categorize the tools, so it's easy to find. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. And uh, if anyone is having issues with the tool, because this was recently uh, created by you, and if there are any issues that they find while working with the tool, how can they report those issues? Yeah, so uh, the plugin implements uh, one interface that actually exposes this link uh, mm -hmm. to my the the GitHub basically repo that I have. So if you have anything that like bugs or uh, future enhancements you wanna see here, you just click on the Learn More button here, and it will take you to to the issues, and you can just create a new issue. Yeah, awesome. That's so great. Uh, so. Yeah, it was great looking at this tool, um, which was awesome. Uh, and I'm looking forward to using this on any of my portal projects because this is, I, I can see that this can save so much time. Like you have figured out if the entity permissions are available or not. So if any, if any of these entity permissions are missing, I know if they are missing. Uh, I can see if the entities are configured on the, uh, for the web API. You also give the snippets. So, it just makes life so easy because I don't have to think about the code. I just have to copy the code, paste it, put some values in it, and it would save so much of time. So uh, great uh, uh, for developing this tool, Omar. I know I'm going to use this in, in future projects. Thank you, Danish. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah. To connect with Omar, the links are provided in the video's description. I have also provided the link to his GitHub repo as well. So go and check out the tool. Now, as promised, to win a copy of my book, Extending Microsoft Power Apps with Power Apps Component Framework, all you have to do is answer few simple questions. The link to the Q&A is provided in video's description. This Q&A will only be open till 3rd of April. The winner will be revealed on 7th of April. So don't forget to like and subscribe. Also turn on the notification so you get notified whenever I go live. Again, the date is 7th of April when I will reveal who won a copy of my book Extending Microsoft Power Apps with Power Apps Component Framework. Now, if you have not got your copy yet, you can get your copy on the Amazon and the link is provided in the video's description. Thank you.